for joining us today. Um, so this is Animal Behavior 101 with a focus on octopus uh, with Dr. Nick Bellono. Um, so this is part of the Harvard Brain Science Initiative um, collaboration with the Center for Brain Science uh, 101 series. So we've had a, a Neuro 101 series going on for a couple years on Zoom. Um, and this is our first in-person event in Cambridge. So we're really excited. Thank you to everyone joining us in person and thank you to everyone joining in Zoom. Um, so uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce Nick Bellono. He's an assistant professor here in the MCB department. Um, he's a cell physiologist. His lab studies molecular and cellular adaptations um, that give organisms their ability uh, to do unique organismal functions. Um, they study uh, a lot of cool organisms, octopus, as you'll hear about today, sharks, jellyfish, uh, photosynthetic animals. Uh, the lab is interested in signal transduction, protein biophysics, and evolution. For his postdoc, Nick studied with David Julius at UCSF. He studied the molecular basis of electroreception in sharks and skates, as well as chemosensation in the gut, which seems really cool. I'm really excited for this talk. Um, in graduate school, he went to Brown University. He studied ion channels that mediate skin and eye pigmentation. Um, so he's going to talk for about an hour or so, and we'll have uh, time for an extended Q&A at the end. Um, if you're joining on Zoom, please feel free to type questions into the chat box uh, throughout the talk um, or later raise your hands. Um, and just a quick logistical detail, um, at the end we have some food uh, to go snacks and if you're joining us for the lunch, we can meet over there where the lunch is. Um, so thank you very much. All right. Can everyone hear me? Mic is working? Okay. Okay. All right. So. Um, as is introduced, our lab studies how organisms adapt to their specific ecological niche. Uh, and in this context, we're really interested in how single cells and proteins can integrate diverse signals in that specific ecology to mediate specific functions. And so what I'm going to talk about is octopus um, for an example of, I guess, what's animal behavior 101. And so when I think about animal behavior, um, I really don't know how to think about it, honestly. So we, we try to study our curiosity, and so how does one really study animal behavior? I guess to us, what we like to think about is Crow's principle. So for such a large number of problems, there will be some animal of choice or a few such animals on which it can be most conveniently studied. And in terms of the molecules associated with these behaviors, we like especially ion channels uh, which serve as molecular gates that control the movement of ions across membranes to mediate a variety of different uh, physiological functions. And ion channels can be tuned to facilitate the evolution of such behaviors. So this all sounds like a clever plan to study animal behavior, but in reality what we do is we just follow our interests. So one, I think, great example of this is the sea robin, which we have in the lab, which is this totally bizarre walking fish. You can see it coming around the tank here. Uh, and we first saw the sea robins when I was at MBL to pick up a cuttlefish, which I'll talk about later. Um, and the guys in the Marine Resource Center told me, like, you got to see this fish. It's great. It's super weird. And so we went inside and, um, of course, picked up some of those fish and came back and thought we should definitely study those. And we started by just burying things in the tank because what the sea robin is supposed to be able to do is use these leg-like appendages, which are actually modified fin rays, to crawl around on the sea floor and then also to sense buried prey. And here you saw it scratching at this little uh, clamshell. And so how does it do this? Where does, um, where does this behavior arise? What are sort of the developmental programs that give rise to these unique leg-like things? Uh, and then what are the uh, molecules which endowed with this chemosensory ability to find buried prey. So again, it sounds like a really nice system where we can think about the evolution of a novel sense organ uh, from those two perspectives. But in reality, what we did was we got the sea robin, we buried some stuff, we saw if it can dig it up, we buried it a little bit deeper, we saw if it can dig it up, and it seems to be very good at this, and so we kind of went further to look for what are the you know, cells and, and molecules um, and we kind of just kept uh, failing. We couldn't really find, because we didn't know where to look. It's a weird crawling fish. No one had studied this. Uh, and so then we got lucky because we went back to the MBL 
to get more sea robins, and we actually got the wrong sea robins. Uh, and these sea robins still has the legs, it still can uh, crawl around, but then it doesn't sense and dig up the buried prey. So now we have a really great comparative system. So this is one example of our sort of approach to animal behavior, which is look at an interesting phenotype and then be open-minded as to how to study where it comes from. So another great example, I think, which is ongoing, is piranhas. Uh, so let me pause these guys. So on the left is, um, well, maybe I should explain first. So uh, piranhas, we just got in the lab pretty recently, maybe a couple of months ago. Um, Peter in the lab, who's in the audience, actually stopped playing volleyball to attend this, so thanks. Uh, Peter um, was interested in piranhas because like, who wouldn't be the piranhas, they're great. Uh, but we didn't really know what we would study or kind of how this would go. Um, but one thing um, which maybe you're familiar with is this feeding frenzy behavior where one piranha attacks and then all the piranhas come and they rip up whatever they're after, right? And so he got the fish um, with, uh, which wasn't trivial in itself. I can't see where the mouse is, oops. Okay, now I've lost it. Okay, so he got the fish and on the left, he puts them in this well-fed condition where they're kind of checking out this fish in the tank, but not really doing anything. And then you can see on the right, once one fish uh, senses the prey, all the fish come and they just attack in, in this collective behavior. So now we have this really interesting behavioral phenotype, which we're going to try to dissect in sort of a similar fashion as I just explained the sea robin. How exactly are they triggering this um, collective behavior? Well, how does one piranha signal to the others? Again, we have kind of no idea how this is going to work, but we're going to explore and, and try and do sort of um, simplistic experiments. So in summary, animal behavior 101, how does one study animal behavior? We don't really know. Uh, we follow our curiosity and then we try and discover and understand some molecular building blocks. So um, to sort of demonstrate this approach and how it can go in sort of an unanticipated direction, I'm gonna talk about our studies in octopus. Um, and I'm gonna start with this great video that also Peter just sent me um, this morning, and I'm not good enough at PowerPoint to embed. So hold on, I'm gonna pull it up on YouTube. So the octopus does this great behavior where it explores the seafloor and it does so with its long flexible arms. And this allows it to sample cracks and crevices for prey. It does so by presumably sensing molecules and, and also tactile stimuli. Uh, and, and it can do this away from its traditional sense organs. So if it doesn't see what's in the rocks, it can still pull it out. And this is one way in which the octopus has become a very great um, benthic predator. So Peter sends this video, which shows the octopus crawling on rocks, and I really hope that the music's gonna play. Okay. <laughs> this is why I mostly like the videos for the music. But you can see the octopus, it's really sampling these rocks. It sort of attacks um, prey once in a while, wraps its arms around. And, and this is just a really nice looking octopus. Okay, cool. All right, so I'll go back to uh, our videos. Okay, so why we were interested in the octopus um, in terms of our broader question of how do cells and molecules integrate different signals is really based on the arms. The arms are just great. So the octopus has this a uh, distributed nervous system where the majority of neurons are localized along the arms. And it looks like this, where the nerve cord extends the length of the arm, and then each um, ganglia along this nerve cord hooks up to one suction cup, which is used to sense and then probe and retrieve prey. Uh, and what's really interesting about the arms is they can do quite a lot autonomously. And this is pretty extreme to the extent that the arm can even be severed and will still um, you know, reach and grasp at, at prey items or, or chemicals, as we'll show later. So you can see this example um, from the lab where the octopus is separated from a crab, which is stuck down to this suction cup onto the tank floor. And you can see that even when separated, it finds the crab very well. It probes with its arms. 
And then its arms are also very strong, right? It's just like a pure muscle and will pull back this crab. And so you can imagine that this is like sort of um, recapitulating what happens in, in the wild is that jazzy octopus was looking around through the rocks. So in addition to liking this aspect of um, signal integration of the arms, the other thing that's very cool about the octopus in, in context of our interests of how do animals adapt to their specific ecology is the octopus does this really nice taste by touch behavior. And so why this is very distinct is if you think about how chemosensory systems work in terrestrial animals, volatile molecules are sensed through the air, they're airborne, as where um, a lot of aquatic animals sense highly soluble molecules which can diffuse through the water, but the octopus actually has to make contact with surfaces in order to sense. And so it seems to sense at least what was um, hypothesized, these rather insoluble molecules that are localized on the surfaces of what the octopus might distinguish. So this is sort of the problem. How does the octopus do this very interesting behavior? What are the adaptations which underlie this behavior? And so in the beginnings of that problem, we looked back to the literature to start and what was known uh, comes from these um, electron microscopy studies looking at anatomy um, in the mid 60s, uh, largely done by Jay-Z Young and others. So Jay-Z Young's the guy that found the uh, squid giant axon and just really loves cephalopod uh, nervous system and has a huge book of just drawings of cephalopod nervous system. And one of the things that he noted was in the epithelium of the suction cup of the arms are these cells that look very much like uh, receptor cells of other systems. So we went back and used um, fluorescence microscopy and some neural stains and found indeed that there were around the, the suction cup these cells that looked very much like those receptor cells that um, Jay-Z Young and others saw in the 60s and then also were connected to these stereotypical tracks. So having seen that, we can start to ask, how do animals um, detect and integrate multi-sensory cues from their specific environment using the octopus as a model system? And I'm gonna sort of demonstrate our approach, which is to try to understand um, cellular properties and, and proteins. Uh, think about how the nervous system interacts, in this case, between the peripheral and central nervous system, which we really haven't done much with yet, but I'll talk about a little bit. And then ultimately, how does this uh, influence behavior. And so I'll talk a little bit about um, some comparative studies we've done of cephalopods that occupy different niches. Okay, so with that in mind, um, we wanted to uh, start exploring the system. And the thing that seemed most important to us in trying to understand, again, the building blocks was to see if these receptor cells are really receptor cells. They might look the part, but are they really functionally mediating um, this taste by touch sense. So what we did was we developed a preparation where we could isolate individual cells from the epithelium of the suction cup, and then we could probe them for things that the octopus arm cares about. So what we started with was using uh, patch clamp electrophysiology, which allows us to measure um, electrical signals in cells, which tells us whether or not the cells are activated by uh, particular stimuli. So we used patch clamp, and then we also probed mechanosensitivity by using um, a, a glass patch clamp um, pipette and then um, distending the dendritic ending of these cells. And so we would record, poke the cell, and then see if there's a response, as simple as that. And what we found was that um, this cell, among these three morphologically distinct cell types that we could see, and again, there's probably a zillion subcategories within these, but at least from what we could see by basic morphology, this cell with this kind of bulbous ending was the only one that would re respond to uh, mechanical stimulus. And it responded with this very transient inward current, meaning cations flow into the cell and likely mediate um, an excitatory event. These other two cells did not respond. So great, it seems that there is actually a touch receptor in the arms, which we would expect given that you know, the octopus probes around with its arms. So next, we wanted to ask about chemosensitivity, given that we're interested in this taste by touch sense, is there really a chemoreceptor cell? So what we did was we first tried around with sort of known chemosensory agonists like amino acids and other things, 
uh, that one might expect to be active in a chemosensory system. And we didn't find anything, so we went with a much uh, more brute force approach, which was to take something that the octopus cares about, grind it up, filter it for small molecules, and then stimulate cells. And what we found was that these elongate cells respond very robustly and very stereotypically to this fish extract, where we can see this inward current, again, representing cations going into the cell and likely an excitatory event. So it seems that the octopus does have these specific cell types, at least based on morphology and function, which match what was seen in the OLVM and our initial histology. But now we can tell that indeed there is a specific chemically sensitive cell and touch sensitive cell. So given that information, we can now start to think about what are the molecules that mediate the signal detection. And what we do to probe a molecular basis for physiological function, often in the lab, is to use transcriptomics. So to ask whether or not specific tissues are enriched for transcripts that might encode proteins which facilitate these functions. And so what we did was we profiled the sensory epithelium of the suction cup, where we found those cells that are functionally um, important. And we compared with other sense organs, like the olfactory organ, the eye, or uh, reference tissues like skin and brain. And what was sort of uh, expected, but maybe unexpected, was the only known sensory receptor that we observed uh, to be enriched in the sensory epithelium is called NAMP-C. And this is a mechanoreceptor ion channel, so it seems to make sense in that the touch receptor uh, is expressed in a touch-sensitive tissue. But what was sort of surprising is we didn't see any known chemoreceptors. Uh, so looking further, we can see that this NAMP-C is, um, if we localize the RNA using in situ hybridization, it co-localizes with neural markers, and it's found in the sensory epithelium of the suction cup. We can also clone it, characterize it, it looks the part, uh, it matches the properties that we see of the receptor cells, so all of that makes sense. But again, uh, how are chemicals detected if it's the only known uh, sensory receptor? So we decided to be a little bit less biased in looking for known sensory receptors, uh, and we looked for other things that might be interesting. And what we found uh, was this family of ionotropic receptors, which was interesting because they look like acetylcholine receptors, but they lack the acetylcholine binding site. And these were first noted in the octopus genome for this reason. And now we see that they're, they're very enriched in this sensory epithelium, similar to what we see for NAMP-C, that, that touch receptor. Uh, and to give away the whole talk, uh, we call them chemotactile receptors, uh, which will, I'll sh explain why. Um, so these, these chemotactile receptors, or CRs, we found actually localize uh, to the uh, receptor cell looking cells in the sensory epithelium. And in fact, they actually co-localize sometimes, which I'll talk about for a minute. Uh, and we also made an antibody and can see that um, the receptor indeed, or that the staining indeed localizes to those same receptor cells and actually seems to be enriched in the dendritic ending, which is exposed to the environment. So all this kind of points toward maybe these are relevant. Uh, and furthermore, we see that these are conserved across octopuses. So if we look um, at other octopuses, the CRs similarly diverge from these nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. But ultimately what we wanna do is go back to function. Are these really mediating this uh, chemotactile or chemosensory modality. So what we do um, is we compare with native uh, receptor recordings. So this is a patch clamp recording from a native chemoreceptor cell, like what I showed earlier. Uh, and in this case, we're doing, um, we're exposing the cells to either fish extract uh, or nothing. So you can see that fish extract in black elicits this much larger current. Uh, and the current is inward current, uh, and meaning that more cations go into the cell at negative voltages. So this is, again, consistent with the idea that this fish extract is eliciting an excitatory response. And it also gives us information about sort of the biophysical profile of this response, because we can see at which voltages do we get more current, uh, which gives us sort of a signature of what um, the, the molecule might, molecule's function might be. And now we can compare with native chemoreceptor 
to cloned channels. So what we do is we clone these channels and then we express them in cellular systems where they wouldn't normally exist, where we can overexpress them and look at really large signals and then compare to these um, native responses. So to give you an example of these experiments, this is a heterologous expression system using uh, frog eggs where we inject RNA, the frog egg makes a ton of this protein, and then we can measure what it does. And so this is one of these CRs where we expose it to uh, either fish extract or acetylcholine. And what you can see is that there's really no response to acetylcholine consistent with the lack of the um, acetylcholine binding site. But then the fish response looks very much like this native chemoreceptor cell. And you can see that in controls, the uninjected oocyte, there's no response to anything. And if we put a nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, we see that indeed it's very responsive to acetylcholine, but doesn't care so much about fish. So it seems like we're on the right track. There's these CRs that are enriched in the right spot. Uh, they're conserved across octopuses, and they seem to respond to the same sort of chemical mixtures at least. But why are there so many of them? And why are they expressed in these diverse combinations? Why might this make sense for a chemosensory system, which likely needs to detect many different types of molecules? So what we thought was maybe that they're facilitating the sensation of just different chemicals. And so how we started to test this was by just taking that crude fish extract and separating it into hydrophilic and hydrophobic components, and then stimulating these two uh, receptors, which were able to express and homomeric complex, which I'll talk about later. Uh, and what we see already with this very crude separation is that one responds to the hydrophilic component and one responds to the hydrophobic component. So already it seems like the receptors are detecting different molecules. And we can see this is true in the native uh, receptor cell where some receptor cells respond only to hydrophobic and then some respond to both fractions. And so ultimately what this is, is indicating to us is that different CRs and different cells likely encode distinct molecules. And maybe this makes sense for a chemosensory system, which would need to probe you know, many different kinds of surfaces and environments. So we can take this further um, by screening these two receptors with specific molecules to ask, again, are these uh, specifying which signals are detected and which signals are transduced? And so what we did was we took sort of a biased and unbiased approach of the screen where we used chemosensory stimuli, at least for other systems like amino acids or, or tastants or, or things like this, and stimulated um, independently expressed receptors to see if they respond to different things. And what was sort of surprising was that these receptors responded most robustly, or at least one, to these terpene molecules, which are most often found in bacteria and plants, and not so commonly thought of for this kind of chemosensory system. Uh, and so we thought maybe this makes sense because these things are usually insoluble. And so we can test whether or not that's true in the native receptor cells. And what's interesting about this result is that indeed, these cells that are responsive to this fish extract do respond to those terpene molecules, but they also respond to different terpene molecules. And this again indicates to us that most likely each receptor cell is expressing either different receptor or different combination of receptors to mediate this broad sensation. Um, and we can do, you know, lots of sort of controls to see whether or not this is dose dependent and particular um, portions of the protein mediate sensation and so on. So our hypothesis at this point is that CRs facilitate this taste by touch in aquatic environments. We see them across octopuses. It makes sense for what the octopus needs to do in its ecology. And now what we're seeing for the molecules that are detected, maybe this makes sense too, in, the, in, in that these terpenes are poorly soluble molecules. They're found in plants and some marine sources, and perhaps they're suited to this contact dependent chemosensation where the octopus really does need to touch surfaces uh, in order to, to um, taste them. So um, with having made that observation, we can start to think now, knowing some of the building blocks, how are these distinct sensory signals integrated to mediate these autonomous arm behaviors? And so what we wanted to do um, to start to think about this was to really probe the nervous system. So we've looked at some molecules, we looked at some isolated cells, but what is actually the, the nervous system of the octopus arm in code? And so what we did was we made a prep to record from the axial nerve of the arm. So that's the nerve right here that runs down the middle of the arm and then sends out 
uh, or from the ganglia sends out these processes that connect to the individual cups. And then we can uh, record from the nerve uh, while stimulating the arm or the suction cups on the arm with different chemicals, and then measure neural activity to see whether or not um, those signals are transduced to the nervous system. And what we find is that indeed, uh, if we stimulate with control, this is just seawater, the arm doesn't do much. If we put this fish extract, we get a response. And then if we put these terpenes, we get really robust responses. And the profile matches very well um, in terms of the arm doesn't really care about amino acids, sugars, stuff like this, but it does respond to this, this extracts and then it responds to these terpenes. And furthermore, we can block um, the responses to the terpenes with um, a, a CR antagonist that we've identified. Um, and so this is nice. We can see that it seems these particular signals are being transduced to the nervous system, but was what was sort of an unanticipated um, observation in doing these recordings is we also saw that when we stimulated the arm uh, and recorded neural activity that the arm moved around a bunch. And so then we could really start to, to also quantify whether or not these agonists, in addition to eliciting neural signals, elicit this autonomous arm behavior. And it's at this point pretty crude arm behavior. It's literally just the arm moving around. Uh, but it tells us that indeed this, this information is being transduced and encoded. And the profile matches very well with what we see for the receptor cells and nerves. So our hypothesis, given this information, is that a lot of signal integration is beginning at the level of the sensory receptor. There are different receptors in different cells encoding these different molecules. This is all somehow transduced uh, and, and encoded in the nervous system to mediate this behavior. But what I mentioned before, I had us think about um, how are these, these signals being integrated in terms of why are these receptors all co-expressed? Why are there so many? Uh, and, and why are they expressed in these diverse combinations? So in these in situs, um, this picture is a little small, but what it shows is that not only are they expressed in a diversity of cells, but sometimes actually the CRs are co-expressed. So what does that mean for individual cells responding to different molecules? So to think about this, um, we thought about further the um, proteins that these guys are related to, which are these cis loop receptors, in particular the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. And the, nicotin the nicotinic receptors are actually pentameric uh, ion channel complexes. So five subunits come together to form the ion channel. And these subunits can either be all the same, so they're homopentameric, or they can be heteromers, meaning that different subunits come together. And why this is important is because when these different subunits assemble, it changes the structure of the channel complex. And by changing the structure, the channel complex can alter how sensitive it is to particular agonists and which kind of ions it passes. And so we thought maybe this made sense for a chemosensory system uh, because of course, if there was more diversity of channels, maybe there'd be more diversity of chemicals detected and signals transduced. So um, a lot of experiments I'm not gonna talk about, we found that indeed, if we co-express these subunits, they can physically interact. And this means that they can probably, um, we don't know in native tissue, but they probably can form these um, heteromeric complexes. So what would this mean? Well, because we can co-express them in these heterologous systems, we can characterize whether or not the expression of different combinations changes properties. And what we see is that indeed by co-expressing CRs, we can see um, altered ligand sensitivity. Um, we can see that different ions pass through the channel. We can substitute the ions while stimulating these different complexes. We can see that different amounts of ions are passed through the receptor. So this is recording from one protein at a time. Each of these deflection represents opening and closing and where we can measure how many um, ions go through the channel. So already by just co-expressing these subunits, we can alter not only what's detected, but also what kind of signals are transduced. And furthermore, because there are so many of these and so many possible combinations, this is probably just uh, really crazy to think about. So we're not going to think about it too much. So what I can say from this is that distinct agonists elicit uh, different cellular signals through interacting with specific channel complexes uh, with these diverse biophysical properties. So this could be one way in which the octopus could uh, 
detect and encode very different signals, even at the level of one protein, which might suit this distributed nervous system. So uh, to summarize so far, our, our hypothesis is that sensory integration begins at the level of the sensory receptor. We see this in that individual uh, receptor cells exist where there are mechanoreceptors and chemoreceptors. Uh, their, their function is mediated by different receptor proteins and that these receptor proteins, at least in the, taste, or in the case of these taste-like receptors, the CRs, they can specify uh, signals through passing particular ions or binding particular chemicals. Uh, and then in some data that I don't have time to talk about, these different um, receptor cells actually have different electrical properties, which make them encode this information differently and in where one can produce a bunch of action potentials and one produces only this phasic activity. So again, it's very different signals coming together. And we think that ultimately these signals are encoded to mediate this autonomous arm behavior. But in order to ask further about this hypothesis, we wanna go back to the animal and see if this stuff even matters. So we came up with this very clever uh, assay where we can pour some agar on the tank floor and then infuse one side with a chemical, put seawater on one side, and then see if the octopus does something different. So we tried a bunch of more complex things of like, I think at one point we we're doing octopus Y maze and all this stuff. But again, going back to sort of simple fundamentals of animal behavior, these are my favorite kind of experiments. We can just see something really simple. And what you'll appreciate in this video is that the octopus does these sweeping arm motions on the control side. These are very stereotypical. We see them all the time, whether there's control, whether there's control, control. Uh, but then once it touches this terpene side, you'll see that it retracts its arms and it does these really fast touches, which we can quantify. Uh, and what's really an important result from this behavioral assay is not only that the animal is sensing those terpenes, but you can see it's doing it in a contact dependent manner where um, in ways we've quantified, uh, the control side looks just like if there were no um, terpene on the other side. So it seems that indeed it is integrating this, this touch and chemical information. So, um, so with, with, with all of that, our hypothesis is that CRs facilitate taste by touch in aquatic environments, and that this is suited uh, in terms of how signals are integrated, how the receptor complex can do a lot of signal filtering even at the level of the one protein. Uh, we think this is suited to the distributed nervous system of the octopus. And we think in terms of which molecules are detected, this makes sense for the ecology of the octopus in doing this taste by touch behavior. Um, but if we wanna think more about, um, oops, some kind of error just came up. Upgrade your Harvard Mac system. No, thank you. Okay, I'm just gonna put that down here. Okay, so, um, so this is our hypothesis, but if this is truly related to behavior, then we should be able to sample comparatively different cephalopods which occupy different niches. Do these proteins adapt to facilitate those different behaviors? So we started to think about that in context of um, octopus or octopods versus decapods, so cuttlefish and squid. And cuttlefish and squid occupy a very different niche in terms of the squid being um, pelagic, so found in the water column, versus the octopus, with, which I just showed in a lot of ways, is, is benthic and exploring the seafloor if we think back to the jazzy octopus and the rocks. Uh, and then there's something uh, sort of in between, whereas the cuttlefish, uh, unlike the octopus, which probes around with its arms, it's actually this ambush predator that will either camouflage or hide and then emerge and strike with its long tentacles. And so what's very different about these two systems is the octopus has eight arms, as does cuttlefish and squid, but the cuttlefish and squid also have these two tentacles, which I, as I just described for the cuttlefish will use in this ambush predation to strike the shrimp, which I'll show in a minute, and then retrieve. So um, our animal of choice is the pajama squid, which is uh, confusingly actually a cuttlefish. Uh, and in this video, you'll see how it does ambush predation where it's buried in the sand. There's this unsuspecting shrimp minding its business in the corner. Uh, and then the cuttlefish emerges, strikes with the tentacles and captures.
wraps it up with its arm. And we'll bury back and eat that shrimp. Uh, okay. So, um, again, a very different behavior, still using arms and predation, but in a, again, very different way. So we thought we would ask, uh, given this different behavior, do the arms still have chemoreceptor cells? Do they have these CRs? If so, are they somehow adapted to facilitate different function? So what we did to start was we figured out again a prep to isolate these receptor cells and then ask if they're chemically sensitive. And what we found is that indeed using this shrimp extract, we can get uh, robust responses. So that's this inward current of cations going into the cell and that these responses are blocked with the CR antagonist. And furthermore, shrimp elicits really robust um, action potential. So indeed, these signals are encoded um, in the nervous system. Then we can do the same kind of tricks as we did in octopus, which is to do transcriptomics, where, and these in situ hybridizations, where we find, um, again, receptors that look very much like these CRs. They lack the acetylcholine binding site. They're enriched in the sensory epithelium, just like octopus, um, but they're maybe fewer than octopus. Otherwise, it looks pretty similar. Uh, we were able to clone one of these and express it, uh, and it allowed us to do kind of the same series of experiments to screen these receptors for molecules which might be active on chemosensory systems. And what we found in this receptor was very different than what we saw in octopus receptor. So in this case, uh, the cuttlefish receptor was not at all responsive to terpenes, but instead responded to this bitter tastant called denatonium. And denatonium is completely irrelevant to the cuttlefish, uh, but is often used as a bitter tastant in a, in a variety of chemosensory systems. And in fact, for us, it's the most bitter compound we can taste. It's so bitter that it's used in um, children's toys so that they won't eat them. Uh, so the, the cuttlefish also seems to care a lot about this, this bitter molecule. And we can see this is true in the native chemoreceptor cell as well, where um, exposure to denatonium elicits this inward current. So um, great, it seems there is a CR uh, and it's sensitive to different molecules. So like I said, this is in contrast, at least with one of the octopus receptors we, we characterize where it's um, insensitive to denatonium, but responds robustly to terpenes, so these poorly soluble molecules, as where cuttlefish instead responds to these soluble bitter tastings. So why might these care about different molecules? Uh, so if we think back to the behavior, like I said, the octopus explores around its tank, uh, probes with its arms, finds the crab, captures. Uh, the cuttlefish, uh, in contrast, is this ambush predator at weights, for the shrimp to come, exposes itself, strikes, and then retrieves. So we thought um, maybe there's something to do there with why it would care about bitter tastings versus these poor, poorly soluble terpenes. So we went back to behavior, uh, and what we did was we looked at, um, again, our, our favorite auger assay, uh, where we took videos from bottom up, and you can see that the octopus is is spread out and probing control, and again, doing these like very fast um, touches on, on a terpene-infused side. But in contrast, the cuttlefish doesn't care at all. The cuttlefish lands on control, the cuttlefish lands on denatonium, it just sits there. So it doesn't seem to care about denatonium in the sense that it probes around the surfaces. But, but we thought more about this, that there's a very distinct behavior and distinct animal that's not probing with its arms and instead is doing this ambush predation where it captures. And we came up with, I think, an even better assay than the agar floor, which is to soak shrimps in denatonium or seawater and feed them to the cuttlefish. Uh, and what we found was that the cuttlefish will eat just fine the seawater soaked shrimps, but if we soak them in denatonium, they'll catch the shrimp, they'll wrap it up, and then they'll kind of like freak out for a little bit, and then either they'll eat it or, or not, but they handle it for much longer because they're very confused. So we think that perhaps the cuttlefish is using its arms in a manner more analogous to our taste, where it catches its prey and then it samples whether or not it should consume. Uh, so in contrast to taste by touch for the octopus, maybe it's taste by trap for the cuttlefish. Um, so having probed these two systems, where we find these very distinct um, functions for these receptors that are related, uh, we can start to think about where does 
a sensory receptor come from? How does a sensory receptor adapt to facilitate different animal behaviors? And what's very cool about this system and unexpected um, because we didn't know what we were gonna find is that these receptors are closely related to these cis loop family receptors or these neurotransmitter receptors. So we can start to think about not only how do octopus and cuttlefish receptors facilitate different adaptations, but we can go back to think about how does protein go from facilitating neurotransmission to now environmental sensation. And so to think about that, what we really needed to do is to see the proteins. And so we started working with um, Ryan Hibbs at UT Southwestern to, to look at the actual structure of these proteins. And um, we're not so far into this, but I can tell you a little bit about it, uh, where we have managed to get pretty high resolution structures of both octopus and cuttlefish receptors, especially in the extracellular domain, which binds the ligands. Uh, and so we can start to look at the protein and see how has the protein changed to facilitate sensation compared with structures that we already have for nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. And then we can compare octopus and cuttlefish to see what's different in these two receptors to mediate differences in uh, binding different chemicals, which ions pass, and how this is different than binding a neurotransmitter. And so um, to, to start to talk about these differences, uh, what we sort of expected and we do see is that there are structural differences underlying these specific functions. One which we, again, anticipated was the lack of this uh, acetylcholine binding site. Because we, again, we've characterized this functionally where the nicotinic receptor doesn't respond to terpenes, but responds very robustly to acetylcholine as where this octopus receptor responds to terpenes, but not acetylcholine. And in the structure, we can already see um, that if we compare the human nicotinic receptor with octopus, so octopus in blue, human in gray, um, the octopus lacks uh, loop C, which, is, which facilitates high affinity binding of acetylcholine by kind of wrapping around acetylcholine after it binds in its pocket. Um, and this is sort of what we expected based on the sequence. But we can also start to see very unanticipated things. And so one great example of an unanticipated discovery uh, comes from looking at these structures where on the left is the um, nicotinic receptor binding site, where blue represents hydrophilic residues, orange um, hydrophobic residues. And you can see the pocket for the neurotransmitter receptor is sort of a mix of hydrophilic hydrophobic. It's a small pocket. And then in octopus, this pocket's totally occluded by um, a disulfide bond. But then what we also see is the emergence of this large hydrophobic pocket. And what was really cool and sort of dumb is that the um, detergent we used to purify this protein actually is what we resolved in that pocket. And so this insoluble molecule, this, this steroidal detergent was actually bound in that hydrophobic pocket. And so that gave us an insight right away to ask, is this pocket relevant? And we did so by just using the detergent as an agonist. And what we found uh, in screening either the detergent, GDN, or a bunch of things that look like the detergent and are sort of poorly soluble, is that the deter detergent is the um, most potent agonist we've found to date. Uh, <laughs> and then other agonists you know, that look like it are also relevant. And so it, indeed, we think that um, this sort of confirms what we thought based on our screen of just you know, finding around molecules from the biolabs building freezers uh, and sort of stumbling upon terpenes and making up the story about poorly soluble molecules, that indeed, now that we've seen the protein, uh, it turns out that it actually even pulls out this detergent with it. So it really is the you know, greasy molecule receptor for taste by touch, or at least we think. So, so having observed this, we can start to think about how does a neurotransmitter receptor adapt to facilitate environmental sensation and so what we wanted to ask about this is, you know, having seen the structure, having seen these different properties, what regions are under selection? How is, how is this uh, protein family changing relative to nicotinic receptors? And so what we see by just comparing um, substitutions which would actually change the protein coding sequence which, with ones that would not, 
is that this, the CRs seem to be under some selective pressure or changing more quickly than nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. They're also grouped together, representing an expansion in chromosome 15 of the octopus, thanks, we have, which we have the genome, thanks to our friends at MBL. Uh, and so we can start to appreciate that these, I think, fit sort of the bill for a sensory receptor that is evolving to facilitate um, sensation of these kind of weird molecules. And we can take this analysis further, looking across individual amino acids to see which part of the protein is under this um, diversifying pressure. And what's very cool from this analysis is that if we compare with what we've seen in the structure where this detergent is bound, a bunch of these residues that are under really um, strong, strong pressure are the same ones that appear to be coordinating this detergent molecule. So maybe these specific residues are changing across this family of proteins to bind different things, mediate more complex sensation. So we can ultimately test this because we you know, see the structure, we can mutate the uh, protein and then express it and ask if function changes. And so we do that by, by mutating these residues which coordinate the detergent. And we find that indeed it massively affects function where this is one example of changing one of these hydrophobic residues to just an alanine, where we can see that now the channels are constitutively active. So indeed, this region is very important. So here on the left shows a wild type channel where we stimulate with either terpene, steroid, or detergent. We get these robust responses, and we can block with that CR antagonist. Here, there's already activity, um, just basally, so we're seeing basal activity. The agonists don't do quite as much. They maybe inhibit a little bit. And then this um, antagonist strongly inhibits the channel. And we can look across a bunch of these mutations. They all increase basal activity. Um, the agonist evoked activity isn't quite as strong. Uh, so it, indeed, it seems that these regions really are what's changing in these proteins with, with probably a bunch of other things that we've yet to characterize. Um, so, we're also comparing this with the cuttlefish receptor now, uh, where we've again found a very distinct binding site for this bitter taste denatonium, uh, which looks different than the octopus pocket. And we can sort of start to compare where does this receptor emerge and, and how do these proteins evolve. OK, so with that, I'll summarize and say that I think this represents um, a great example for looking at the evolution of a sensory receptor, because we can go from proteins that facilitate neurotransmission to now sensation and sensation in these distinct contexts being octopus and cuttlefish. Uh, and we think that this is really cool for thinking about how animals adapt to their specific ecology in the context of this taste by touch sense. Uh, and we really think in a, in a larger sense that this is really a, um, an interesting way to think about the evolution of, of biological novelty. So how does you know, the octopus go from being this clammed mollusk to now this animal with very sophisticated body plan, um, behavior, and a, and a variety of different traits. So coming back to animal behavior 101, how does one study animal behavior? I think that this is a good example where we go in without a preconceived notion of how this should work. And we end up with, um, you know, some, some fundamental building blocks where we can start to try and understand how the system works. Yet, of course, there are many questions which remain. Uh, what are the connections between ecological niche and, and novelty? Uh, what is the diversity of natural ligands for CRs when they're not detecting detergents? What do they care about? Uh, and then are these specific subunits, because they can combine in all these different permutations, are they somehow regulated by context to facilitate different behaviors? And I hope you take away some, some broad principles with, from this, which is that sensory systems are, I think, specialized to accommodate an animal's ecological niche and context. We can use this to exploit, or we can exploit these, these systems to understand um, mechanisms of adaptation, behavior, and protein structure function. Uh, and ultimately, one great takeaway from the octopus in the context of, I think, how we think about neuroscience often uh, is that really single proteins are very important and understanding how single protein properties contribute to complex signal integration is key for understanding um, cellular and organismal behavior.
So with that, I'll say uh, thanks, and I, and I hope this work shows um, our curiosity-based approach to science and really just caring about how interesting biology works. Uh, so with that, I'll take questions. Just a quick announcement. Uh, if you ask a question here, we're going to run the microphone to you so that people on Zoom can hear. So questions? Hi. Um, I think it was a good talk. Uh, you mentioned you were looking into squids as well. Have you seen any like interesting sort of differences between these um, receptors in the squid versus the other cephalopods? Yeah. Um... We haven't explored the squid uh, in contrast to the cuttlefish so much yet. I think it will be interesting because the squid is pelagic, which is very different than both of these creatures. Um, it, the squid very likely has a handful of these receptors. I don't know where they are, what they look like, or anything yet. Um, but I would expect it's probably different, yeah. Hi, thank you for the talk. It's great. Uh, I was just curious about active touch versus passive touch and whether you've thought about that and how that might influence taste. Um, you know. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I really don't know. Uh, what I can say is that from what we see in the physiology, it seems that at least the touch receptor that we've been characterizing, both the protein and the cell, has this very phasic response. Uh, whether we touch the cell for you know a handful of milliseconds or if we do it for a second and just distend it uh, without stopping it's the same response and so what does that mean um, for for passive maybe maybe it allows the octopus to be passive and it really needs to sense like a moving crab where there's you know on off more often i i'm not sure but that would be my guess hi a few questions. Um, one, is there any evidence to suggest that an octopus can taste itself? Mm. Sort of. Uh, so there's this pretty brutal experiment uh, where, I forgot the group, but they cut off octopus arms either from different octopuses or the same octopus and then gave yeah. it back to the octopus and they respond very differently. Really? Yeah. Okay. Maybe yeah, that makes sense because you could imagine, I mean, this animal's body plan is kind of crazy, right? If it's reaching around and how does it not just like tangle up into an octopus ball? Yeah. And so that would suggest that each octopus has a unique fingerprint like taste. Perhaps. Okay. And the second question is these things can be expressed in different, like the different subunits can be expressed in different like relative concentrations, I guess, and then we'll combine into different unique uh, receptors. Um, within a single octopus's lifetime, it could express, like perhaps like learn to express different combinations of them in different cells. And so they could be just like learning through expression. Have you, have, or if, I think you get what I'm, getting at. Have you all yeah. looked into that at all? Yeah, we're, so we're thinking about that now. Um, we, we started by exploring whether or not um, the animals might express different abundance, different amounts of these proteins. Uh, and now we've been thinking more about whether or not the proteins might change based on context. And so the octopus and other cephalopods are really good at editing their RNA. They do quite a lot of this. Uh, and so they'll change at least what's known is that they can constitutively edit RNA. And what we're testing is whether or not they can edit RNA based on context. And this would be a fantastic way for the octopus to acutely change the structure of one of those subunits and therefore the function of one of those complexes. And maybe based on yeah, its experience or its current status, change what needs to be sensed and what the resulting behavior looks like. I don't know if any of that's true yet, but we are testing it now. Thank you for the presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, so several questions. Uh, one is whether uh, there could be 
potential applications in bioelectronic noses um, using these um, chemo, chemo receptors, chemotactile receptors. Um, secondly, is in the context of mating, um, related to a previous question um, of self-identification, um, whether these chemotactile receptors could be used in engage um, in uh, identification of other mates nearby. And finally, the aspects of the ubiquitous microplastics present in oceans, whether these could affect the functionality of these chemotactile receptors. Okay, um, I'll do questions two and three because I already forgot question one. So two and three, um, mating, uh, probably, I don't know. Uh, so we've, the only thing that we've done to look at that, so there's the male has this um, highly adapted arm called hectocotylus that it uses to deposit sperm packets into the mantle of the female. Uh, so does it somehow sense the mantle or something? Uh, seems a good question, I don't know. Um, so what we've done is we've transcriptionally profiled the, these like little, they're not quite suction cups on the hectocotylus, they're like these little nubs that look like they're about to be suction cups. We've profiled those and it seems um, in preliminary analysis that they do express the CRs and a lot of them. I don't know that they express like maybe particular combinations or types or something that remains to be determined. And then it remains to be determined what actually they would sense uh, in that context, right? So it seems likely that there's, I, I would guess some function there, um, but I don't know what it is. And then in terms of microplastics, I have no idea. Um, yeah, <laughs> what I can say uh, about what's sensed in the ocean um, is we're trying to, th we're, right now we're trying to think about what's different about different surfaces. Um, I don't know how this relates to microplastics exactly, but we're trying to think about, you know, the octopus touches the crab, it touches the rock. How does it know crab to rock? How does it know, in our case, we keep them in these little cups where they you know, probe the cup and then they'll find the crab. And so we've been thinking about what could be different about these surfaces, which aren't super interesting, but the octopus seems to distinguish even in the absence of its other sense organs. And what we've been hypothesizing is maybe it's not the surface, but it's rather what grows on it. Uh, and so we've been looking at microbial diversity on these different surfaces and whether or not there are specific metabolites produced by those microbes that might be what the octopus detects. Because like I said, for terpenes, it's usually thought of in plants or, or bacteria, not so much from animals. Not that there aren't any animals that produce them, but that's sort of the idea. Um, for plastics, I don't know that the octopus, you know, maybe it would sense some synthetic thing from plastic and that would change, I don't know, some, some aspect of its behavior seems likely. And that's certainly demonstrated for lots of other animals. What was your first question? Okay, I can ask after if you want. Maybe we'll take uh, a couple from, uh, from Zoom. If we could take a couple from Zoom. Uh, if Shams, maybe you just want to unmute and ask uh, your, your first question. Um, uh, hi. Um, uh, really cool talk. Uh, uh, I just have two quick questions. Um, one, do you have a rough estimate of the number of one-to-one -one protein coding orthologs between humans and octopuses? And um, the second question is based on just looking at your slide on the DNDS ratio. I was wondering if you knew how much of the octopus genome is evolving under genetic drift or neutral evolution. Yeah, uh, okay. So to, to the first question, um, is there one-to-one -one relationship with human and octopus for nicotinic receptors, I guess? Um, I don't think so, um, but I can't say for sure. I, I think there's, there's a handful of cis loop receptors in octopus that look like nicotinic receptors or other you know, neurotransmitter receptors, so it's kind of hard to say. Um, for the second question, there was actually just, um, I don't know, last week, a study about this, um, about 
looking at genomes of a variety of cephalopods and asking those sort of questions. Um, I, don't, I don't think I could answer in you know, <laughs> a concise enough way in this Zoom, but um, definitely check out that paper. I'll, I'll just, uh, Kyle had a sort of follow up to that second question and then maybe we'll move back to the live audience. Sure. Kyle, you wanna unmute and ask? Yeah, um, I think given um, his response to the, uh, the genetic drift question, I think we can pass mine, thank you. Uh, so this is kind of throwing back to terpenes, I think. Um, I'm just curious if the different subsets, if any of them are found specifically in bacteria that might be present during decay, and if maybe that's how an octopus might tell, like, this is a live squid or a live like shrimp and I should eat it, versus yeah. this is like a decaying shrimp and it'll make me sick, like similar to sour smelling milk or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's... Um... That's largely our idea. So we started with just crabs and what's growing on crabs and kind of thought about it more where I think the most likely scenario from what we see in the behavior, and of course the behavior is pretty artificial with the auger floor and whatever. Um, so it's hard to, to say what that means about valence. Uh, does the octopus like this thing or not? Maybe it's just kind of freaked out because, you know, now the floor tastes like a terpene. Uh, but it does seem that they're responding uh, as if the terpenes averse and in other systems, a lot of these molecules that we're characterizing are aversive. Uh, and I think that maybe what would make sense going back to the active passive touch question is maybe the octopus probes these cracks and crevices, it finds a crab moving and it grabs it. But if there's some chemical that tells it this is a deterrent, this is a, you know, I don't know, toxic slug, don't eat that, um, maybe then it retracts or maybe a decaying thing or whatever. And so we, we've actually just uh, started that experiment to look at either the live crab or the really gross decaying crab and see what's growing and what's different. So the heterooligomeric uh, receptors are constructed to deal with specific uh, molecules in the aquatic niche. Do uh, spe the specific combination exist in the sensory cell already, or does the specific molecule help formulate the specific combination to deal with that? Well, it's a subtle question. Yeah. I don't know. That's a good, I don't know, it's a good question, I'm not sure. Great talk, I'm, yeah, so I'm interested in the high rate of molecular evolution of the CRs that you showed. And I'm, I'm wondering, based on earlier questions, are there a lot of marine organisms that have evolved aversive molecules on their surface to avoid predation? And, could that be the driving force between these, this, this high rate of evolution? Yeah, yeah, um, it seems likely. There's certainly a lot of marine invertebrates that produce a variety of toxins and other sort of aversive metabolites. Um, definitely slugs come to mind and different mollusks, which the octopus certainly eats. Uh, so yeah, it's, that could be a very good reason for doing so. And, and maybe to the, you know, to the question about the de decaying crab as, as we probe further what actually, you know, in, in a more natural context that the octopus cares about, maybe we'll start to learn that and, and appreciate more that that's what's happening. So we kind of have to identify from both ends, I think in this case, what's actually being sensed, how is it being sensed, and then sort of come up with a hypothesis where we can ask these, these questions. Maybe Raven, Nikita, can, can you unmute uh, and ask, uh, you had a couple of questions, sort of general ones. Well, there was a question on Zoom, uh, including 
are you uh, adventurous enough to tackle large uh, marine animals like those? Oh, so sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I was having trouble unmuting. Um, no, my, my first question was, um, yes, that was one of my questions. My question was, um, would you, yeah, be able to like, um, or how would you, and, or if that's something you guys would think about is looking at um, larger marine animals like manatees or narwhals. I know that obviously would have to be out of lab. That was uh, my first question. Um. I mean, it sounds great. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll go see the narwhal for sure. Uh, <laughs> That's kind of the reason I asked you, personal interest. Yeah, we've tried um, to to look at um, large predatory sharks actually mm. very recently, and it's pretty hard to get samples. Um, yeah. And then it's also very hard to go. I mean, I think one one beauty about the study I just just showed is that we can go from not only you know, a bunch of sequences where we're not sure what they do and express them and make um, hypotheses about what that might mean, we can actually probe the real system. And that means from the cells to the behavior in the lab. And so it's, it's much more powerful in my mind to, to say something, you know, conclusive from molecule to behavior than to try to infer based on, I don't know, missing links there. And that certainly comes up when we try and think about these large uh, predatory sharks, which are great, uh, but are difficult. <laughs> but a narwhal, that might be worth it. <laughs> no, I know, right? Um, no, but that actually brings me to my next question is because I was almost blown away. Um, well, let me back up a second. I'm a master's student in anatomy and neurobiology. So I was almost blown away by the fact that the methods you're using are exactly what we're using to study um, cell and molecular uh, neuro. So um, with that being said, I guess I'm like now, I guess, formally curious in this subject. And I'm wondering how, or like, what are the next questions you were gonna ask? You had mentioned that you're looking at like the relationship between the peripheral and central nervous system, but you guys hadn't like dove into that yet. And I um, was curious what the next things uh, your team were, um, was aiming to find or look for. Yeah, I think before we go um, too far into thinking about I don't know, neurophysiology or, or computation or interactions between peripheral and central nervous system, what we'd really like to do is to better define sort of the first step. What are these receptor complexes? How do they mediate signal diversity? Can we find a handful of real ligands and stimulate different receptors and then see how the information converges? And I think we have a lot more work to do there. And I think some of these questions, like what was asked about, you know, is this Aversive, um, maybe we'll find through exploring whether or not these stimuli are aversive, maybe there'll be ones that the octopus likes. And maybe by knowing that information, we'll be able to go to the nervous system with a more informed approach. So to me, I think, you know, understanding some of the fundamentals is, is key before thinking too deeply about, um, I don't know, higher order processing. No, that makes complete sense. That's exactly why we have like ba basic sciences and neuro, and neuro. So thank you. I appreciate you answering my questions. Do we have more questions in the room? Anything else on Zoom? Okay, if not, then thank you so much for your wonderful talk and thank you to the audience for your wonderful questions. Um, So if you're joining for lunch, if you can just meet up there near the sandwiches um, and uh, everyone, please take some snacks as you leave. <laughs>